Hello and welcome to In This Corner. I'm James Smith. Determination, focus, and spirituality play a critical role in the lives of so many champion prize fighters. Those factors, along with some pretty darn good boxing skills, certainly were the case for our guest today. We sit down with one of the best 168 pound champions of all time, Andre Ward. Andre talks about his early years being raised by a single father in Hayward, California, and his entrance into boxing at a young age with a fierce determination and focus to succeed. Ward then takes us through his journey to the Olympic gold in Athens in 2004, and then his professional path to becoming the best 168 pound fighter on the planet. Then I climb inside the squared circle where Andre demonstrates an assortment of skills that have made him unbeaten for about the last 20 years, or at least until this interview was done. Let's see if Andre remains unblemished after stepping in the ring with Smitty. It's one-on-one -on -one with Andre Ward coming up on In This Corner. This Corner is brought to you by the Las Vegas Dental Group. Have an emergency? Need any dental work when you're in Las Vegas? Visit my friends at the Las Vegas Dental Group. Go to lasvegasdentalgroup.com for more information. In This Corner welcomes Andre Ward, SOG, to the program, finally. Good to see you. Good to be here. Let's talk a little bit about, and I want to get into this, uh, your childhood, growing up in in California, it wasn't the easy, easiest of childhoods. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, uh, my father, Frank Ward, he raised me as a single dad, me and my brother. Um, my mom, she was in and out of my life. And, you know, my dad, he was, you know, he was serious about being a parent. And, you know, I didn't really have a lot of room to, to, to get in trouble and hang out and do those kind of things. I mean, I went to school, um, came home, went to the gym, and that was like my life for many years. And, uh, but even though I wasn't in the streets, I saw a lot of things that, that caused me to grow up fast. You know, my father, he had substance abuse issues, even though he was there. You know, my mother, like I just mentioned, she was gone. Um, and when you see those kind of things and you start to understand them, even at 10, 11 years old, it, it causes you to grow up, it causes you to mature fast. And, um, you know, but I thank God that my dad was there. And I thank God that at this point in my life, I got a relationship with my mom, but I think those, those moments are what, what helped mold me and shape me into who I am today mentally. Your, your dad passes away at age 46. What were you, 17, yeah. 18? Yeah, 17 years old. I mean, how did that affect you? Oh man, that right there was uh, probably one of the roughest things I've had to ever deal with. Um, we just got back from a tournament, the under 19 championships in Reno which was maybe four hours from my house. Um, I was fighting one of my rivals, Curtis Stevens from New York. I said, Dad, man, I'm fighting Curtis in the first round. I need you here. So he hopped in the car. He came up there. I beat Curtis. I, beat, I won two other fights. I won the tournament. And uh, the next week, you know, I get the call that, you know, he's dead. I mean, just like that. And Was he in good health? Uh, as far as I knew. But they did, you know, test on his heart. And he had heart disease, and they said he should have been on a list to get a transplant. Now, I don't know if my dad knew. Looking back at the pictures now, I, I could tell he was sick. He didn't look right, but I didn't notice it at that time. And, it, you know, from there, man, I went downhill. You know, I started getting in trouble. Um, that was my excuse because I didn't have answers on why that happened to, to start messing up and almost blew my dream. I mean, I came really close to not going to the Olympics. I stopped training for several years, started running with the wrong crowd, you know, but I had the likes of Virgil in my life, uh, my mother, 
who just helped me during that time get out of that hole, man. And, and I thank God that I got out just in time to qualify for the Olympics, go on to win a gold medal, and the rest is history. When did the boxing love bug first bite Andre Ward? Well, a lot of people don't know that my first love was baseball. You know, I was a pitcher and a shortstop, uh, great athlete, and just a rough kid. I was, you know, just very physical. And my dad, who grew up in San Bruno, California, he fought on his high school team. He had boxing at the high school when he came up. And he was just, you know, he's a heavyweight, 15 and 0. And he was just telling me about his rivals and his stories and how he trained. And I told him one night, I said, man, dad, I want to do this. He said, if we do it, we're going to stick to it. And I went to the gym. And uh, the first day I went there, gym was closed. We came back the next day. And it didn't go too well. <laughs> you know, and my dad said, he doesn't have it. He, he, you know, Bird said, hey, man, give him some time. Give him some time. And my dad was more hands-on, do it this way. And, and, and Verge made it, made it fun. And when I got with Verge and my dad kind of stepped back, I started to evolve into this, this, this protege and this talent. And one thing about me was, you know, I had no problem working hard and I was competitive. And those ingredients made me to what I am today. Let's talk about your amateur career because you had a fantastic uh, amateur career. About, I think it was about a 10-year amateur career, which would lead to the Athens and the gold medal. But take us through your amateur career. Man, it, um, I, started at, I started training at 9, had my first amateur fight at 10. And I just started at small, small shows like we call smokers, you know, mm. free one-minute rounds. We started locally, then we would travel to, you know, Central California, which is an hour or two away. And then we would go to Southern California. And then we would go, you know, to the Nationals. Um, one of my first big tournaments was the Silver Gloves in Lenexa, Kansas. And that was like the tournament for a kid that was, you know, just getting started. And I just kept winning. That's where Ringside is based out of that Lenexa. That's company. where Ringside is based yeah, out of. Right. I just kept winning. I kept winning and I was competitive. And I had a great coach in Virgil. And I mean, this thing just started to take a life of its own. And then I went from just, you know, hoping to win to expecting to win. And, and that has allowed me to have a winning streak of, uh, you know, since I've, I haven't lost a fight since I've been 14, 15 years old. What caused that shift, you know, the, the, the expecting to win? What, it, what caused that? I credit, you know, the winning streak, the mindset to, to go into a tournament or a fight, you know, believing I'm going to win, to my coach, Virgil. A lot of people give him credit for being a strategist in the ring, you know, teaching you how to throw a right hand, a jab, and, and all those things are good, but he, he's a... He's a life coach. And a week you know, away from a fight or a month away from the fight, he's telling me the things that I need to know. And he told me them enough where I started to believe him. You're the best. You know, hey man, put that last tournament behind you just won. We gotta get back going because that kid you beat, he's still training. And those are the kind of things where even though I was a humble kid, I was confident. And I, I give a lot of credit to Verge for that. The, the kid from California wins a gold medal in Athens. How did that feel when you're up there on that podium getting the gold? What, what was, was going, going through your mind when the national? I was trying to process it all. Like I was the last, I was literally the last gold medal that the Americans won in the whole Olympics. So I got out of the ring, they rushed me to the back, changed clothes, and next thing you know, I'm hearing the Star Spangled Banner on the stage like, trying to process the fact that I just won a gold medal and I beat all of these guys and I'm the best in the country, best in the world. That was hard to process. And, and again, even now looking back, it's still something that's hard to wrap my brain around, but I did it. And thinking about maybe probably your dad, Frank and Virgil going through your head, your family. It's bittersweet, bittersweet without having my dad there because my dad got me in the sport. My dad, um, he started me out. And just like I would talk to Virgil about it, I, I talked to my dad about it first. Man, I want to win a gold medal, dad. And, and he believed in me, um, but to not have him there, man, it was tough. But I feel like he was looking down on me, and I, and I know that even though I would rather have had my dad there, that drove me. Like, it was certain intangibles that I had when I stepped on the scene in Athens. You know, my faith, my coach was there, uh, but the fact that my father wasn't there, that, that drove me to, win, to want to win that medal. I want people to call me champ. I want everyone to respect me. I want to go down in history as the greatest ever. So I'll perfect my technique. I'll throw harder than anyone I face. 
Every day I'll make my hands faster. I'll increase my endurance. I'll get all of this by being the first to the gym and the last to leave. I'll work endlessly to make sure what I want today is mine tomorrow. Because I'm gearing up for greatness. Going to your first fight, 10th fight, was there a point where you realized, okay, I'm going to be a force here too. I'm going to be a world champion, not just an Olympic champion. And not that easy. Mm -hmm. Not that easy. And I say that because uh, I felt like, you know, we got a lot of slack, a lot of, a lot of pushback from the media and the fans about, you know, moving too slow. But I think we moved just right. I mean, my second fight was against Kenny Cost, a uh, guy from the Midwest, 6-0, and a six-rounder. So I had that one four-rounder on HBO, then jumped to a six-rounder. And we fought solid competition. And anybody that's going to fight a, a gold medalist, they got everything to, to, to gain and nothing to lose. So we were going through that process. And then, you know, I hit a fight against a guy named Darnell Boone. You got dropped that fight. Right? I got dropped that fight. But it was a situation where Verge kept saying, hey, when you're in clinches, this is the pro game. Don't relax. I didn't listen. Then I was looking up at the lights. But I got up. And I not only got up, but I won the next two rounds. And that was the moment that, and I knew that moment was coming. I just didn't know when. That was the moment that I knew that I'm a fighter. I'm not just a hype job. I'm not just a great amateur. Like, I'm a professional fighter. Because I got up, and I kept fighting, and I won that fight. And then the, the, the maturation process just took place. And then I had my moment in 2009 against um, uh, Mikhail Kessler, Super Six Tournament. Nobody picked me to win. If I was on the other side, I probably wouldn't pick me to win. I hadn't done anything up until that point for anybody to pick me against a guy who had more knockouts than I had fights. But like my father used to always say, man, by the grace of God, we rose to the occasion. And up until that point, I had the best night I'd ever have in a professional boxing ring, and I won and won my first title. You're one that's able to have a goal and not just, you know, write it down, but make it happen, and that in involves a lot of focus. Well, I, I can't take credit for everything. You know, I, I give credit to uh, the two men God put in my life, my father and then Virgil. You know, they helped mold my work ethic. Uh, they stayed on me and stayed on my brother about, you know, the dream that we set out to accomplish. and. I remember one time when I was going through a rough season, man, after my father passed, and this kind of sums up everything right here. And Virgil, you know, I remember saying, man, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm done boxing, man. I'm tired of this. You know, I don't, you know, I'm maybe two, two and a half years away from the Olympics. He said, son, listen, let me tell you something. He said, if, if you don't get focused and get back on track and you turn that television on and see guys in Athens that you could have beat, he said, you'll never be able to live that down. And he got off the phone. And he let me sit with that and think about that. And it's those kind of comments and those kind of things that throughout the years kept me focused. I remember complaining going to the gym because I didn't get a chance to hang out. I remember my dad telling me, son, listen, I love your friends, but if they don't get focused on something in life, you're going to be traveling the world, living your dream, and they're going to be in the same spot. And some of those guys are in the same spot that they were 20 years ago. And I'm living my dream right now. So I would tell any young kid, dream big. It's not just something I'm saying, like if you have a dream, dream big, write it down. And if you have anybody in your life, man, a grandmother, a, father, yeah, a teacher, that can help you, listen to them. Because those people ha are older than you. They've been places that you haven't gone before and they can help you get there. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be rough. It's going to be tough. But when you get there, man, you're going to be able to look back and say, man, I made it. And then help somebody else reach their dream. S.O.G., Son of God, how important is your spirituality uh, to you? Well, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's not a crutch, it's, it's my lifeline. Mm -hmm. And it's not just something I, you know, talk about before a fight because I want to win and it makes me feel good. Like, that rough patch I told you guys about earlier when my father passed, like, me, me going from just uh, a relationship with God that my dad introduced to me, I found God for myself. And that helped build me out of that pulled me out of that rut that I was in and allowed me to, to not only get back in my career, 
but stand up and start becoming a young man and then eventually a man. So I don't, without a, my relationship with God and my faith, like I, I don't know, I don't want to know what I would do at 29 years old right now with a little bit of money, a little bit of fame, and the access to the things that I have access to. It grounds me, it keeps me, it protects me. It's more than just something I talk about, it's a lifeline. Another great part of that lifeline, your wife Tiffany, uh, three boys and a girl, tell us about your family. Man, me and my wife, we started young. You know, we started young. Uh, we had our first child at 16 and 17 years old. And um, we had our second child maybe a year and a half later. And, you know, I just, I, she was a high school sweetheart. We didn't go to the same high school, but we fell in love with each other in high school. And, you know, even though I tried to be a player at one point in time in my life as a young man, I wasn't very good at it. You, you like routine, <laughs> I told you that. I was always a one woman man. So you know, I just knew I loved her. And I knew that, you know, I'm trying to live right. I'm young. We need to get married if we're gonna be together. We've already had a child, we've had two children, we need to do this. And, and we got married young, we've been married 10 years now. And people ask me, do I party, do I go up? Nah, that's my party. Like raising my kids and being there for them when I'm not training is something that's important to me because I don't wanna be a dad that, that they know from a distance. They know Andre Ward the fighter, but yet I'm never home to really get intimate with them and actually raise them. So to have them there, you know, it keeps me grounded, but it also gives me something to work toward, raising them up the right way. But my wife, man, she's my backbone. I couldn't do what I do without her. And a lot of times when I reference my career, I say we. And she said, why do you say that? It's you getting in the ring. I said, yeah, but I can't do what I do without you. When all is said and done, how does Andre Ward want to be remembered as a fighter and more importantly, as a man? That's a great question. Well, I mean, as a man, I want to be somebody who was known to uh, live out his faith, you know, in the public. It's not something I push on people, but this is just, this is part of my life through the good times, even the rough times like I've been going through the last year. And somebody who had integrity, uh, and somebody who, you know, fought for himself outside the ring and was a businessman when it came to the professional side of boxing. And then as far as in the ring, just a fierce competitor who fought the best and beat the best. Well, there's argument as to who's the best pound for pound boxer in the world. Uh, but on my list, uh, clearly the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter is SOG, Andre Ward. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate that, Smitty. Thank you. This corner is brought to you by the Las Vegas Dental Group. Have an emergency? Need any dental work when you're in Las Vegas? Visit my friends at the Las Vegas Dental Group. Go to lasvegasdentalgroup.com for more information. In this corner steps inside the ring with the great Andre Ward. In terms of the basic, there is no more basic than the jab. Mm -hmm. In your case, the left jab, which I feel the most important punch yeah. in boxing. What do you think? I agree. Uh, a jab can set up a lot for you, and a jab can also get you out of a lot of trouble. You get hit with a big shot and you're hurt, that jab can keep a guy off of you and keep him out of range, and it also allows you to, you can win around with a jab if you know how to use it. So the jab is just a, it's a lost art today. One of the things I, I love that you do is you, you, you fence with it, you know, to get that distance. Give us a little illustration here of Andre Ward's jab, fencing, setting up. Well, I'll give you an example, even with a southpaw. You turn this way for a second. When I fought Chad Dawson, this, it allows me to touch him, feel him, and then boom, come over the top at the same time. And he doesn't know if I'm gonna parry with it or if I'm gonna faint and come over the top. 
So this is just something that allows me to not only get in range to punch, but it allows me to get out of range, throw a punch at me. Then out, control you with this. Can move you. Can block with it. I can keep this here. If I got my hand, if I got my right hand up to protect for a hook from a hook, you can throw whatever you want to throw. I'm in here. See Floyd, Floyd Mayweather does the shoulder roll. He's got this up to protect from the hook. And he's got this shoulder, throw the right hand. Sometimes he'll roll. He's perfected that. Yeah. I was always taught to use this. Mm -hmm. So when you throw a right hand at me, throw a right hand, I can hear, I can hear, here, I can counter, boom. I can, boom, make it real discouraging for you to want to punch yeah. if I don't want you to hit me. And one punch that I stole from Floyd Mayweather that he originated was the jab to the stomach. Straight to the solar plexus. Put both your hands up. Guys are not ready for the jab to the stomach. You can, I can look a guy right here, boom, hit him in the stomach. That's a body shot, but it's at long range. I don't have to be in close and be susceptible to short shots myself. I can be long range the first two rounds Boom, give me that air. Steal air from them. Boom, it's just stabbing them in their, in their gut. These days, a lot of fighters are taught hands first. They never look at their feet. Just throw a jab, you're teaching the kid how to box. I was taught feet first. Learn to use your feet with the jab. So that way, throw at me. Throw, just throw a combination. Control you with my feet. I don't have to throw a punch. I'm making you use your feet. And all of a sudden, I'm back up inside and we're gonna fight the fight I wanna fight. Now, in the center of the ring, I don't even have to move that much. It's inches, but it starts with my feet, not my hands. Here, here, throw a jab, here, here, boom, got you, I'm off. One of the things I, I, I've noticed about you is sometimes you're throwing a punch to set up another punch. Yeah. Give us an example of that, talk about that. Yeah, well like I just mentioned with the jab, it all, for me, a lot of times, it'll start with a jab. So, I don't even have to throw a punch and I can see what you do if I faint you. Okay, Smitty's got his left hand down. Boom, I can faint you. I can quick. step out here, boom, come over the top. That's, that's the left, pick your hand up. Sometimes I faint this way, boom, and a guy will drop that. So I say, okay, I fainted him one time. We faint him again, okay, he did it again. Faint him a third time, I got him, boom, boom, boom. Come with two or three shots because every time I fainted you, you dropped it, you dropped it. And this time, boom, I made you pay for it. Yeah. Talk about being able to, let's call it bum rush, but with technical skills. Well, it's just, it's just being physically strong. Mm -hmm. So some people, they don't know how to categorize my style. So they'll say, oh, he's, he's, he's got speed or he's, he's a good boxer. But, but, you know, I'll use the phrase that Bruce Lee used before. I'm formless. I don't have, I'm, I'm going to be whatever I need to be. So one thing that people underestimate with me is they, they get ready to, to, to fight, and the, and the cat is out of the bag right now, but they train to just fight a boxer, but the next thing they know, boom, I've slipped up inside of them, and I can push them back, and I can beat on them. Here, boom. They throw. I can block, block. Come, boom, boom, boom. Hit you three times. Like with Chad Dawson, we just kept pushing them back. The next thing you know, I'm up on you again, but I'm hitting you with short shots. Bing, bing, bing. And no time to react. Bing, bing. Getting you out the way, then we start all over again. Take you back to deep water, let you think about what just happened, and then I'm right back again. And it just keeps going on until you break down, and then all of a sudden, boom, boom, like with Chad, and, and the shot gets through. Is it important for you to go down as one of the great fighters of all time? Personally, it is. I mean, when I got into the sport of boxing, my goal was to be one of the greatest that ever did it. That, that's my goal. And I think that's any fighter's goal who's competitive. And um, I want to have a, a Hall of Fame worthy career. Well, we waited about three years to get this done, but it has been our pleasure and more importantly, my pleasure to step inside the ring with one of the greats, Andre Ward. Thank you. Smitty, I appreciate you, man. Thank you.
this corner is brought to you by the Las Vegas Dental Group. Have an emergency? Need any dental work when you're in Las Vegas? Visit my friends at the Las Vegas Dental Group. Go to lasvegasdentalgroup.com for more information. The United States has only won three gold medals since 1992. Oscar De La Hoya at the 92 games in Barcelona, Spain. David Reed at the 96 games in Atlanta, Georgia. And our guest today, Andre Ward at the 2004 games in Athens, Greece. Here's hoping that his story will inspire more youngsters to lace them up early as amateur boxers and maybe with Andre's determination, dedication and focus, they too can earn gold medals and perhaps become world champions as professionals. In This Corner wants to thank Andre Ward for joining us.